Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, Fading Memories listeners. I have an awesome guest for you today. We are discussing how to advocate for yourself and your loved ones on getting off of maybe unnecessary medicines. So please welcome Dr. Delon Canterbury. He is a doctor of pharmacy and he has decided that it's time to change the world and he's he's doing his part. So thanks for joining me. Yes, uh, pleasure to be here, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Awesome. Well, as m- some of my listeners might know, and I was telling you before we hit record, my dad was on 26 different prescriptions mm. before he ended up on hospice. And wow. I do know that there are, you know, we we go to the doctor, we feel cruddy, and we want to be fixed. We want to feel better. And so right. sometimes the quickest way to do that is to give us a pill. Mm-hmm. Whereas maybe the best decision is... Let's up your exercise and change your diet and all these other things that take time. We don't want to do all that. Right. Right. (laughs) So it's not just the medical profession that is causing this problem. We had to change our attitudes Mm -hmm. as well. But, you know, how do we go about deciding? Well, you know what? We're just jumping right into it because I've been so excited to talk about this. Tell me about yourself first. I'm sorry. <laughs> and your company, Geriatrics. Yes, for sure. <laughs> so no worries. Um, I am a board certified geriatric pharmacist. Um, graduated from UNC Pharmacy School 2014 and landed myself right into the world of retail pharmacy, where I managed a Walgreens for about six, seven years. And unfortunately, during that time, all I would see at my pharmacy counter would be uh, my senior patients or my minority patients falling through the healthcare system's cracks. And I mean, it could be financial barriers. It could be um, not understanding a patient doesn't have a phone number, like simple things that we take for granted that had someone taken the time to just talk, they really could have had these issues solved. So seeing that there's such a huge need for social barriers, like addressing social barriers from a really rural setting, um, I found that our seniors were the ones who honestly had the highest risk of side effects, the highest number of drug interactions, and the highest number of pills that they're taking among any other American age group. So if we don't have advocates or people who can maneuver these meds and all these complex patients with an aging population and less and less senior care providers, well, we have a lot of work to do. And there's a lot of work around the corner for us to do to stop over-prescribing. So I decided, let I'm going to start this company. And unfortunately, it was actually more of a familial point for me. My grandmother was I also had dementia. She was in a nursing home. She was prescribed an antipsychotic called ciprazidone completely inappropriately, right? Just been on it for months and was spiraling out of control with her dementia symptoms. She was angry, irritable, confused, and was wandering. And essentially, it wasn't until four months later where a retail pharmacist saw the med and was like, hey, this is why she's having issues. It literally took two weeks to have her symptoms resolve back to normal. So again, the power of a pharmacist knowing how to ask those questions and saying, you know what, you don't need that is what I want to embody for my patients because it shouldn't come to my grandma being kicked out of a nursing home and forced into my parents' home, making them caregivers to eventually you know, get them off the med to where she can get back to normal self. So shouldn't be that way. And caregivers, I know, go through so much as it is. So why not advocate as much as we can and use our best kept secret, the pharmacist? I have recently learned how much we should befriend our local pharmacist, which is good information to know. I thankfully am on zero meds. I take a bunch of supplements, but I don't, I don't have the, um, 
I don't have the need. I don't go to the pharmacist, which is good and bad. So yeah, I, no, but I I have learned good. to, you know that that there's a lot a pharmacist can do in our caregiving journey. Yes. One one recently was that you know you guys can look at what medications people are on and say, hey, you're on this X med. You know, maybe you shouldn't be driving because you're on this med and you have to stay on this med because, and you can, you can kind of, the pharmacist can be kind of the bad guy on the stop driving conversation without being the bad guy. So I'm like, why did I not hear about that? My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. I, and the one thing she did remember, even close to the end was that my dad gave my brother-in-law her car. She was still mad about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was she was clearly still mad about that. <laughs> yeah, it was um, you know, just yeah. interesting what you remember and you know, just like certain things just stuck with her. It was crazy. But okay, so we were before I was like jumping right in because I was so excited. You know, my dad was like I said, he was he was diabetic and so he was on, you know, the traditional diabetes medications. He had a kidney transplant in 2009, so he was on the anti-rejection meds. I don't even know what the rest of that cocktail was doing or what they were for. Sure. I mean, they all need, you know, you should not have to Google a pill and try to figure out what it's for when you're trying uh -huh. to take care of somebody. So there, there was our first problem is in knowing, like, what do these all do? So should, and this was when he came out of the hospital. So what should we have done? in that situation to like educate ourselves on what he was taking. Just talk to good, our local pharmacist. <laughs> that's a good question. So here's here's the bottom line. 275,000 people die each year because of mismanaged medications. So they're dying from meds that aren't working. They're taking them and it's not working, right? That's close to $500 trillion we waste. I'm sorry, $500 billion. <laughs> dollars. That's why I'm right. Five hundred billion dollars. <laughs> Half a trillion, right? So we spend that much because of meds not working, and people die each year. Two hundred seventy-five thousand die each year from that. A lot of those errors take place during the transition of care process. So that process where you're leaving the hospital, going home, or going to a new nursing facility, whatever. There are huge opportunities that I feel our system uh, sucks at addressing is the medication management piece. It's the, are we educating the patient and the caregiver? Because sometimes they have dementia, they can't just do it themselves. They need someone to notice, right? So what are we doing to assess health literacy? What are we doing to assess those social barriers? Do they have finances to afford the meds? Do they have transportation to get the meds and pick them up? All of those play a role. So as soon as we start talking about those social barriers, the better I feel care will be streamlined from setting to setting. What you could have done or what should have been done was you should have had a pharmacist um, and maybe the provider or another nurse literally do a review of everything. And I mean, everything on your new med list, everything you're not taking needs to be taken off and discussed and communicated. And then there needs to be some type of teach back method from the patient or the caregiver to the provider to confirm that they do know what they're doing once they leave. These can really help close some of those gaps that are not confused with that list and wondering where to start, right? But we, again, it starts with leveraging pharmacists. So yes, you can go to your local pharmacy or call wherever you go, hopefully at a less busy time. You know, things are crazy with COVID and whatnot, but Give them a call and just ask, hey, you know, I'm concerned about my loved one's meds. Is there anything we could potentially get my loved one off of? Um, and a lot of the times, that's the thing. Statistically, 90% of drugs can be stopped without any type of side effect. Now, I'm not saying 90%? to do that. I'm saying about 90%. Yeah. Ooh. Most can be stopped without any type of adverse event. Of course, it has to be done under a doctor's supervision and permission. So I'm not telling people to just stop meds. That's not what we do. <laughs> However, it could be risky. Yeah, it's risky. But I'm saying with, with enough attention and a plan, that's what my company, Geriatrics, does for patients. We specialize in creating those plans that are aligned with the patient goals, the provider goals, and as, assesses those social needs that are needed. 
Yeah, that would have been a lot better than the, my sister, my husband, and I trying to figure out what the hell. <laughs> it, was just, it, was, it had yeah. been a very stressful. He was in the hospital for 32 days. We were bouncing my mom and their dog between three homes. And yeah. with advanced Alzheimer's, that was not fun. Mm-hmm. And it was just very stressful. And then you get this pile of meds. And my dad had literally had a spreadsheet, which I am not a spreadsheet kind of girl, but I probably could have taken the spreadsheet and like the new list from the discharge nurse from the hospital to his pharmacist and said, help. <laughs> probably would have been a good start. Not yeah. really sure why we didn't think, probably didn't think about it because it was just, there was just so much going there's so on. Much, there's so much going on. It's hard. It's extremely hard. It's an emotional piece, you know, spiritual. You're worried about the future. It's stressful. You know, and, and, and then the last thing on your mind is how well these meds work together. You're assuming they work, but the problem is our system doesn't always check for that. So again, we have to approach our medication mindset, like you mentioned earlier, differently and, and assume that they are causing harm, even though they're maybe saving a life. I'm not saying all meds are bad. Meds are life-saving, of course, but some are causing more harm than good, especially as we age. And the body just changes. It doesn't urinate the same. It doesn't clear drugs the same. It doesn't absorb things the same. So though they all play a role in how these drugs work and how that can affect someone falling or having pain resolution. Makes sense. Many, many years ago, and I'm, I'm fairly certain you'll agree, but I'll just make sure that I have not been living under false information we can understand how two different drugs interact with each other. But when we add a third, mm-hmm. we have, there are so many variables for interaction that they really don't know how they mm-hmm. interact. And then like Mike said, my dad was on 26. Oh, wow. Like, I, I just referred to that as pharmaceutical soup. It was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, they kept yeah. giving him, you know, he was on because he had neuropathy in his feet. Well, maybe it wasn't neuropathy, but he had pain in his feet, so they gave him morphine, and the morphine caused some other problems, so they gave him a drug to, to counteract the problems the morphine was giving him, and I'm like, really? Yeah. Whatever. So, you know, it was like, I couldn't tell my dad anything, so wow. I, I had no say in that, but yeah, so, it was just, yeah. that goes back to the, we have to change our mindset, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, yeah. It's almost better, in my opinion, this is how I try to do my life, is just to do, to stay as healthy as possible and try to do natural things to aid my immune system. Obviously, if I needed, if I needed insulin, that I would take insulin, you know, but trying to avoid all those things. So I get it. I think that's a good approach, honestly. Um, And is it uh, true that once you get to like a third medication, you have no idea or, Limited no. knowledge on how they interact? No, I wouldn't say that. I, I'd, okay. I'd say that's something we as pharmacists know pretty comfortably. Um, we still can assess what may be causing more risk than another, right? So you can definitely have, in fact, one of the cases we had had multiple drug interactions. It was more than two or three. It was about five or six and they all compounded with each other to cause this, what's called anticholinergic toxicity, essentially meaning that there's a chemical in the brain that they have way too much of, and it actually masks or mimics dementia or, or Alzheimer's in later stages. When that happens, of course, there's increased risk of falls, delirium, and that can lead to harm and, of course, death. Um, but ultimately, this woman was on 36 medications, and we found six of them had anticholinergic properties that led to her being super sedated, um, confused, irritable, angry. She was described as a walking zombie by her own daughter. And this is a 70-year-old woman who was frail and, again, was on 36 medications. So we were able to get her off of all those meds. We were able to get her down to eight essential medications. And she also returned to her normal self once we took away those inappropriate medications that she no longer needed. So again, pharmacists know the drugs. They know the interactions. They know the risk profiles. 
The problem is we don't recognize pharmacists as people that can do this and our healthcare system doesn't reimburse pharmacists for doing this. We don't even get recognized as providers to do this. So we shouldn't be waiting for a train wreck to happen. Why not prevent it with a pharmacist? That makes perfectly good sense. There's a lot of things we need to fix with our health care. Yeah. Unfortunately. Oh, yeah. That's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> we can go on yeah. that for days. <laughs> yeah. That is true. So if you suspect your your loved one, your person is on, I mean, if what well, let's see. How when should we like have medications evaluated? Just when we think there's a problem? No, or they, they should be num- no. They should be. Thank you for asking that so much. They need to be evaluated every time you're in the doctor's office. And I don't mean a checklist that says, are you on this? Yes or no. That's not a med review. There needs to be a quarterly, if not biannual, um, full sit down with the provider to say, hey, what can I do to get off some of these meds now, today? And you need to ask that every time you're in there, not just once. Not just once, because again, half the time, their records don't even have the right medications on there. They don't even have the right stuff you're taking. So you have to repeatedly and doggedly ask, what can I do to get my loved one off of these meds? The number one question I tend to ask people to get them thinking about this is, are you on or is your loved one on five or more medications? Now, of course, you'll learn in the senior space, people are on dozens of meds, right? It may seem like a no number, but it's really not. And that's the number we want to shoot for when it comes to getting people minimized to as uh, less as possible. So am I on more than five is one thing to ask, right? At your doctor's visit, you're required, if you're on Medicare, you're required to have what's called an annual wellness visit. As a part of that, this is required by Medicare. There is a required Medicare medication, uh, a complete medication review, okay? And that's usually you, the doc, sitting for an hour, going through all the meds. You need to have that done, okay? That's usually done once a year. That's paid for by Medicare. If you're not getting that, you need to demand it. Again, this is another thing you can ask and and, uh, advocate for is I want a full med review on our next visit. I don't want to talk about the other stuff. Let's talk about the meds. Doctors have an ongoing checklist of things to do. So if you're not coming with, here are the three things we want to talk about today, or here's my list of meds. What can we get off? I'm worried about her quality of life. But again, more than five, any side effects. And I mean, it could be an increase in one drug's dose. It could be a switch. It could be one taking away. Any change in anything could be urinary stuff, sleeping, constipation is generally a flag that there's some type of medication side effect. So in the eyes of a pharmacist, assume everything wrong with your loved one is caused by a med. That's the first lesson of pharmacy. So I I said three things, keep an ongoing med list. Are you on more than five meds? Ask for a medication, complete medication review at every visit, if possible, if not quarterly, that's the goal. Um, And then a free for all is is simply asking a local pharmacist, what can I do to get my loved one off of some of these meds? Um, So there are ways to advocate and there is hope, um, but I think pharmacists are the best kept secret in our healthcare system that people can use. I'm learning that. Definitely learning that. So one of the things that I've learned in the past few years is that the, one of the drugs that they put people with Alzheimer's disease on is only effective for up to about five years. And then after five years, it can actually cause more issues. Mm -hmm. I cannot remember if it's Namenda or the other one. Yeah, it's you're like, talking about Dinepazil um, or Aricep. Yes, yes, those. That's uh, the I recognize those words. Yeah, mm-hmm. is that true? Because I don't uh, remember where I learned that originally. It's kind of true. I mean, Alzheimer's is already kind of tricky in itself. Let's be honest. There are minimal treatments, minimal options. None of the treatments out there even really treat. They just manage some of the symptoms associated with it. So with Dinepazil, I've heard of patients take it for life and they haven't progressed, you know, in their dementia and they do fine, right? And there are some who don't respond ever and you have to jump up the big guns early on. I think most people 
you're going to get maximum benefit, you know, could be five, could be 10 years, maybe, if that. When you start seeing symptoms that worsen the condition, like the actual condition you're trying to treat, that is when it becomes problematic. That's when the quality of life goes down. That's when the patient satisfaction goes down. And if you have those things poor, that's going to affect your patient's mood and blah, blah, blah. So when that happens, that is where you have to start weighing the pros and cons of maintaining therapy or switching or just stopping and seeing if they do any better. It doesn't mean that the medication will worsen after five years are up, right? It's very subjective to the patient response. Um, but again, it could be good. It could be bad. What we have to do is assess what are the patient goals and what's the pros and cons of keeping a drug or losing a drug. And most of the times you get on off a drug is usually not going to be harmful, but you never really know. So it's, it's when I, when I asked this question of my mom's neurologist, it was like, it, the answer basically was, it's not doing any harm. Why did not just leave her on it? I'm like, okay. So that um, leads me to the question. Cause you said if symptoms are worsening, how would you know, or what would you look for? Cause this is, this is, this is the $65,000 question here. What would you look for in somebody with a form of dementia or all, well, specifically Alzheimer's, I guess, to that would indicate that the medication is making the symptoms worse and not just it's part of the progression of the disease. Now we're gonna take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. I started using a product that all you caregivers need to try. I started taking AG1 from Athletic Greens after my workouts because I needed a quick and healthy way to refuel my body. While there are lots of options, most don't taste great, and I don't eat or drink things that don't taste good. So what is AG1? Well. With one delicious, mildly tropical flavored scoop, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins and minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to fuel you for your crazy day ahead. AG1 helps support mental clarity throughout the day and you know how important brain health is to this gal. It has over 7,000 five-star reviews and costs less than $3 a day and you know your time is worth more than three bucks. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. I'm sure you're aware that there may be a connection between poor gut health and dementia, so this is another way to help protect your brain. As caregivers to someone with a cognitive impairment, this is also an excellent way to get much needed nutrition into someone who is slowly losing the ability to eat. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is also important for brain health, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to our conversation. Sure. That's a very hard question, um, even for geriatricians to answer or doctors, really, because you don't always know. Sometimes it's a mixed bag. Sometimes it looks the same. Um, my main focus addressing that is ultimately what do the caregivers and what do the patients want? OK, do you want freedom of meds or do you want to still maybe hope that that one med or two is still helping. And if that's the case, if you're open to that, then are we communicating the risks and the benefits? So here's the thing with dementia, we already know that these meds don't prolong your life. Okay. We know that it may improve the quality of life, maybe, but we know they don't improve your life in terms of how long you live. Right. So knowing that, if you have someone who's chronically constipated, would you rather them be chronically constipated with a little better cognition or not constipated and maybe he's having some flares here or two? Again, that's a subjective question. That's what the patient wants or caregiver wants. It's going to be a variable how you respond. 
Um, but you know, what I do is I assess if your life is way worse with this med than it is without, then you don't need it. And that's the, that's the strategy I use to de-prescribe. And of course I do what's clinically sound. It was evidence-based and would also, you know, with your doctor's permission, if they agree to it, those are my parameters, but ultimately I'm looking to get you off of everything you don't need that doesn't improve your quality of life. That makes sense. And I know with many people living with forms of dementia or Alzheimer's, you know, they get very resistant to taking pills or they are in, unable to like swallow a pill. So you got to crush it up and yep. put it in some yogurt or whatever. And it just, it becomes another chore and just like another hassle, which not really the best word, but um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering at that point, if it's, if, you know, like my mom was on the, the nausea pill, I think I'm pronouncing that the right. She wasn't mm -hmm. on very much, mm -hmm. but she got to the point where it was like, pfft, I don't need that. Eh, it was just like always feisty about it. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed to me at that point, I think that's when I talked to the neurologist. I'm like, she doesn't want to take it. It's a, a battle. You know, now we're looking at crushing it up, putting it in food, but she still was self feeding normal, you know, mm -hmm. meals. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, when I got the whole, well, I don't know why we should take her off of it. And I'm like, cause it's a pain in the ass, you know, <laughs> basically yeah. was right. not necessarily the best answer, but it was kind sure. of, kind of the truth. So would that be a, a reasonable time? Well, like another indication of when you should like reevaluate, do we really Absolutely. need all these things? That's a huge, uh, uh, that's a huge sign that it may be time to reevaluate, especially if you're not taking it. That's that's ignorant to think that they're just going to go home and take it because you said so. That's not how people work. So yeah, that would be the perfect time to bring that up. In fact, just speaking off the bat, I mean, there are other options you can consider. Um, they have a patch that could be considered for Dinepazil. They have, um, I think they have a new formulation where you can get it injected into your stomach, like a, a special gel can be put into your stomach and it slowly releases over time. Um, so I would consider other modalities, especially if the patient is non, not really non-compliant, but just isn't there to, you know, really take the meds like that. That's the perfect time to address that. You can't, if it's a battle for you to get the meds in, how can you expect them to get better? if they're not taking it. So that's a, that's a red flag to me to, to definitely look for other options or maybe consider stopping the med altogether. Yeah. See, because my mom, my dad was on like everything and my mom was on next to nothing. So it's, for me, it's hard to know. And I, you know, obviously they're both gone, so I can't back up and go, oh, okay, I've learned this new stuff. Let's try this. Like, let's go to dad's pharmacist and talk about all this all this, mm -hmm. this whole spreadsheet of drugs, <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard to know. And I've learned some things where is it like some blood pressure medications in much older adults can sometimes cause falls because that it overregulates yeah. their blood pressure. I That's had a right. geriatrician talk regularly on the podcast, but now mm -hmm. she's training doctors on how to be better geriatricians and how to better treat, you know, the very, the very older adults. That's awesome. Yeah, I would love to connect with her maybe after the show, but that's exactly what I do. I, I coach other clinicians, um, nurses, senior care providers, caregiver advocates um, on how they can use de-prescribing, which is the safe removal of harmful meds in seniors, and how they can use that to also grow their business. So that's something I would love to also share with your audience is I, I train clinicians how to do the very same thing. And, and, and hopefully have some better outcomes for their patients too. So now we've, we've asked our doctor for an evaluation. Where, where do we go with our advocacy? If they're like, well, it's not really doing any harm. And you're like, well, I don't really think it's doing any good. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you get the, everybody on the same page? Cause I, the reason that this whole episode happened it's because I was doing Instagram before I got out of bed in the morning <laughs> and you had a video on 
how you can continue to make money while deprescribing medications, which that's what got my attention because I've always been an entrepreneur. I -hmm. wasn't aware that general physicians benefited from prescribing meds. I just thought that was part of the practice. Am I wrong on that? Am I, did I, it was very early in the morning, so I could be confused. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of factors on why they are essentially trained to treat everything. One, they don't want to be dinged by quote unquote insurance markers. So there are metrics they have to meet in order to be in compliance or get their quality ratings that dictates patient care. Two, there's also a a subtle fear of malpractice. Some doctors are worried about, well, I have to treat something or else they could sue me. So there's a more propensity to overprescribe to cover their ass. That's number two. Uh, Number three, they are literally trained from birth to treat. That's the only way they know how to solve a problem is to give a medicine. They're not taught otherwise. And so pharmacists aren't even taught this stuff either, to be honest with you. However, we know the drugs and we know what can be stopped. So let's fuse the two and train clinicians for one, better prescribing, better use of the meds that they're currently on. And of course, that means adherence, non-compliance, all that stuff. But then let's talk about getting them off, period. Like most of the stuff we can actually stop. So let's just try it. Let's just try it. So again, there are reasons why they have to treat, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's why not, you're there. That's why I'm there. That's why you're there to get better. I get that. Um, but we as Americans also have to change our medication mindset and assume we need a pill for every ill when we don't. And then two, doctors just do what they're supposed to do. They are not taught how to be prescribed. They're not taught how to get people off these meds safely. And most of the evidence out there looks at younger adults and we're assuming it works the same for our older adults. So even the evidence for these medications are founded on the majority population, but we're not looking at studies full of 70 and 80 year olds. We're looking at young adults who are healthier. So we're exaggerating that they'll respond the same. And again, clinicians aren't taught on geriatric medicine. They'd they'd have no idea. Primary care providers aren't taught geriatric medicine. They're not. That's what geriatricians are taught, but there's less and less of them. So how can we better fill that gap and teach more to be advocates? So when you ask me, you know, what is it more than just, you know, a a med review? Again, a lot of it starts, there are many pieces here. There's training for the provider that's required, right? There's training the caregiver and the patient on how to ask those questions, when to ask those questions, how to be dogged, how to build a case to de-prescribe or advocate for, oh, I'm just a a patient. Well, you're not. People stop meds because of patients saying something. The people that I work with who have results, they say something to the doctor. And generally they have to, they're actually legally obligated to either respond or not, or at least document that patient requested this and I didn't for this reason. Because of that, the power is actually more in the patient's hands than they realize. See, we forget that the patient runs their health. They're the CEO of their health. We're just players in the game. Like the providers are just players in the game. So once the patient understands that, you can literally refuse whatever the hell you want. You can demand whatever you want. Um, I'm not saying to be an asshole to your doctor. I'm simply saying um, push back when you need to, especially if you believe something's wrong fully with the meds. And with our course, with our deep prescribing accelerator course, we teach people how to, how to catch those signs, at least the clinicians, right? So that they can better advocate as well. Now, is that course for clinicians or? Yes. Is it? It's okay. only for so clinicians. That's... So nurses, okay. pharmacists, social workers, it's not for caregivers. Um, it's a little high level based on the, the meds and the requirements to, to be in that space. But again, the more clinicians out there, the more better, the better we can help our, our seniors. So slightly off topic, why are we getting less geriatricians in our medical system as the population is aging? This seems to be a very, a very missed opportunity in my, my world here. It's a huge problem. And the reason is, again, our healthcare system sucks. 
So <laughs> I didn't actually know this, but geriatricians get paid the least out of all doctors. I had no idea. They oh, that's paid... why there's less of them. <laughs> yes. So that there's your answer. They get paid the least. However, they have the highest satisfaction. They have the highest joy. They have the highest like benefit of working in that space. The problem is Medicare populate the Medicare population in our country is grossly outpacing the training of our future doctors, one, but also future geriatricians, too. So there's less geriatricians, more people, less money that's paying them. Um, that leads to, well, the, the writing on the wall where we have a huge need, less advocates, and yeah, and unfortunately, this, this is going to lead to death. This is going to lead to people, more people dying. So this is a systemic issue. It's a healthcare system-wide issue. We have to change our, our fee-for-service models. Um, but yeah, that's why we're seeing more and more people leave healthcare uh, with COVID being kind of the shining light. So a lot of the issues have been going on all this time. Yeah, COVID definitely uh, ripped up ripped the blinders that were left off of mm -hmm. all the problems. I mean, it just shined a light, bright spotlight on every problem all at once. And it's like, mm -hmm. it almost feels like, you know, you need a magic wand to fix it all at once because that mm -hmm. seems to be the only realistic solution. And it's not very realistic and it's not very exciting. You know, I'm 55. Mm -hmm. I am not, ex I'm not excited about all these uh, problems <laughs> as I'm aging. So Doing everything I can to, to age very well. My paternal grandmother lived to 103. And <laughs> she was, I think she was on two medications. She had glaucoma for like most of my life. Um, and she was on a really super low dose of a thyroid medication, which I never did understand because she didn't have a thyroid problem. And she never could explain it to me. So, but literally, I think at death, she was like on two meds. So. Okay. Much better than her son, my yeah. dad. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So she for sure. she is my uh, role model for for living because she her mind was good for the up until the last year, and then I think she had some minor strokes, and that didn't do her brain any good. But you know, at one hundred and three, even minor things are are pretty major. Yeah, that's so, great. And my maternal grandmother lived to ninety one despite vascular dementia. So. Wow. We will ignore wow. the fact that neither of my parents got to 80. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll just focus on the other positive yeah, We're going to skip a generation and, and pass the blessings on to you. <laughs> exactly. Well, my mom would have lived, I don't know, she, she was honorary enough to live to be 103 also, but mm -hmm. she had the Alzheimer's and then she fell and broke her leg and that was the last straw for her body, mm -hmm. which was also a blessing. She died right at the beginning of the pandemic, so... We, I recently recorded something where I'm like, I don't know how I would have survived not being able to see her. Not She was not visually capable of doing Zoom or FaceTime or window right. visits. Just it would have been a nightmare. So, right. right. Yeah. I mean, it was tough, but it was a good thing. Mm -hmm. So what others is it? Did we hit all of the topics we need to tell caregivers? Definitely utilize your pharmacist. You're in charge with the doctor, even though it never feels like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, and not being of Medicare age, there I've had to learn a lot about the Medicare system, one for my mom, and mm -hmm. now I just continue learning for my audience. Mm -hmm. I think I got like nine years left for the Medicare. <laughs> no worries. Well, sure. <laughs> yeah, no need to rush that. Um, nope. Well, I will say for those listening, um, a couple things. One, if they haven't looked into it, um, they may want to consider getting a genetic test. And this is a test that I also provide. It's specific to medications. It's not like an ancestry and me thing. It's literally looking to see if the meds you're taking has any issues with your body. So that's what I specialize in. This is called the field of pharmacogenomics or pharmacy and the study of genes. I know it's a big word, but it's literally just pharmacy and the study of genes. And essentially, we're testing to see with a cheek swab that I can deliver straight to your home, um, whether you would fail a therapy or you may have a rare sensitivity in your brain or you may have a less of a response to those 
antidepressants or opioids, whatever, it has a lot of clinical use. You, you go to a doctor, you get your blood drawn, right? You don't, you get your weight checked. You get your cholesterol checked. You don't, you're going to want to get your genetics checked. That's part of your body, right? So this is a piece of healthcare um, that, I, that I pride myself on bringing to the senior space because I think they're getting left behind when it comes to looking at precision medicine and getting better at reducing harm, reducing risk. So if you haven't, uh, ask your doctor about it. They may not know, most doctors don't really know, but see what they say. Um, But I would say uh, contact a pharmacist like myself who specializes in this or anyone in your local area who has a pharmacogenomics certificate. I'd be happy to support you and get that kit delivered to your home. But, you know, as a caregiver, ultimately, you got to be advocate. You guys are the unsung heroes. Um, You have to keep fighting a good fight. It's not easy. And sometimes you got to take a break for yourself. You know, be sure to set some boundaries, schedule some you time, 30 minutes if you can to, to just decompress from your day. But don't assume all these medications are safe. In fact, they usually are not. And they're usually the core problem of, of what's going on in your loved one's life. See, I would never have assumed they were the core problem, but I knew in like with my dad, I knew they were the a contributing problem. So that's, yeah. see, I have, I have learned things because I've been on social media at times. I probably shouldn't be. Yeah. I have a friend that just visited me. He's a neuropsychologist that's been on the show multiple times Awesome. He finished his postdoc and he's he's going further away from California. So I'm like, hey, why don't you come visit before you get further away? And so he did. So it's like, oh my God, I actually met a friend from the internet. Oh wow. <laughs> my, Sweet. My life is kind of strange, but it's interesting and that's always good. But yeah, it's amazing what you learn. Like social media has changed the caregiving conversation. So as mm-hmm. a Gen X or I'm in between the baby boomers who are horrified by the millennials and the Gen Zs that are sharing everything about their caregiving journey online. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, the boomers don't want to share anything. And the, you know, people like me, I was very careful what I shared about my mom. Sure. But, you know, I, I kind of felt like she was in the advanced stages of Alzheimer's mm-hmm. and people needed to know what that looked like. It wasn't just, you know, she did. She thought of me as her best friend. She didn't remember what she had for breakfast. She didn't remember that I'd been there for two hours when I went used the ladies' room. That was a fun day. Oh boy. You know, it was forgetting how to eat and wearing her shoes on the wrong feet. I don't know how you walk in shoes that are on the wrong feet. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. it's just it's all it's all of these things that you know. That's what I shared, but I tried to share it in a respectful way. So it's just really interesting how. Mm-hmm. You know, the narrative is shifting and we're learning a lot from each other and it's, it's, it's going to be good. So there's hope. (laughs) Yeah, there's, there's definitely hope. You know, there, there are tons of tools out there. We just don't always know where to look. And Mm -hmm. we also know that caregivers are completely underpaid for what they do. It's usually unpaid and (laughs) uh, don't always get the, the, the time of day. When at the doctor's office. And so we have to shift our focus to using interdisciplinary team models that have different professionals that can listen and support and, and help. I mean, we can't assume the doctor knows everything. They, they're, they're not going to. They, their system won't allow them to know everything. <laughs> it's hard. Um, so we just got to see things as a team. And the more people I feel who know how to advocate and, and get people off meds, the better I'm living good. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I really appreciate this. Now, is there benefit for people going to your website? Shall we shout that yeah. out? Yeah, sure. You can check out the website, uh, www.geriatrics.org. That's G E R I A T rx as an x-ray.org you can also find me all over social media facebook linkedin twitter um you can always send me a message there on my website my personal cell phone is on there my email is on there oh, geriatrics <laughs> inc at gmail.com so i want to stress being readily available for my patients at the drop of a dime so that's that's why it's on there 
Awesome. Well, I'll make sure the website is linked in the show notes as always, and maybe your Instagram page. I haven't found you on Twitter yet, but I will go look. Cool. Uh, But I found you on Instagram and that's just, you know, that's where I learned that this is a, this is a thing we should do. And that's why I wanted, why I wanted to bring you on the show. And I very much appreciate it. Oh man. And the whole gene pharmac, oh, I can't even pronounce all that, but the gene (laughs) testing for your drug interaction or not drug interactions, but how your body interacts with the drug. That's fascinating too. So I really appreciate that you joined me today. Yeah, I love it. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me and uh, look forward to more in the future. Awesome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.